I'm Randy. I thought I would give a walkthrough of some of vector source code files. I'll select a few of the code files, give an overview where those files fit in to vector's operation, talk through what it appears to be doing and maybe how it works. This won't be a criticism or critique of the design, um, although from time to time I will point out some areas that appear to be bugs or that people would want, want to investigate changing to help customize or improve vector for themselves. The first file we're going to look at is boot anim. When systemd starts up, it will run this vic boot anim service. Um, it'll check the results of the init RAM file system to see if the there was any sort of RAM post error. If there wasn't, it will then just launch the boot animation program here. This is the boot anim source code. It has a good descriptive header on the top here. Um, some lovely comments on what is going to go on. Um, here is the include files. This file is not presently public. It mostly just describes a common interface that will be used to um, read and write data to the LCD via the SPI connection. These are some fairly standard um, C and C++ headers that will be used. These two right here define the shape of the LCD frame. I prefer the, myself to see a configuration like this in a .h file so it can be changed and tweaked. Um, the number of bytes per frame, so it has the width and the height, which is the number of pixels, and then the pixel size, which is 16 bits. The pixels are um, in a 565 format, so five bits for red, six bits for green, and five bits for blue, all packed together into 16 bits. Then they're doing something here with an anonymous namespace. Typically, that is to do the equivalent in C of doing a static, so that these elements that are inside of the namespace are private and not accessible by another module, yet are convenient to um, get at. So here, this is the path to the animation file that will be played. It's hard-coded in, and it's also on the partition, um, the data file system area that is fixed. It's not in the user space, so user wouldn't have the option of changing them normally, except for on the Oscar bots where you can turn the regular partition into read-write. If you wanted to configure this, make this customizable boot that you could change on a per-user basis, I would typically just say, um, make that actually located into the user file system and then have a soft a symbolic link to the, the default one. But if the user downloaded a custom one, it would just overwrite that um, symbolic link and use that one instead. We have here a variable that is not commented and it's um, just, but it's a bool and a shutdown. That kind of gives us a, a hint. We kind of see this handler down below. Um, let's kind of scroll a little bit here. So what we see is this handler, right, is going to be set up as a signal handler for sig term and interrupt. What is going to happen is the signal handler, if another process like system D or the Vic Anim com completes running or the fault handler starts running, it's going to signal this one to sh stop, shut down, and give up using the display so that they can use the display for displaying regular animations or displaying the fault code. Um, and it's going to call this handler here, which will set the Boolean variable to true. Um, and typically what will happen with a Boolean variable like this is that there'll be a while loop or a for loop that's running through and checking tasks, but it will also regularly check to see if this variable is set to shut down, and then it will exit this, clean up, and stop. And we'll see that below. But what is what I don't agree with and what I think is an actual bug waiting to happen is that this is just a regular bool. What we need is two things to happen here. One is it needs to be volatile because um, the signal handler can occur anytime, at least in normal Unix it can, and that will set the value in for the variable, but the main other thread or the main loop here won't necessarily read it. The compiler has the option to just read that once um, and store that in a register or read it infrequently. And it's just a matter of luck that, that it often works because for some other reason I had to use those other registers for other stuff and read it. 
So the first thing it would want normally be is a volatile. At least that's what I would normally reach to in the past. But what with multiple cores and uh, multiple threads, we would want something else. In fact, we would want it to be marked as an atomic bool. Um, and the atomic bool has an extra feature that is very important. When this other thread, the signal handler, modifies it, and the bool is very simple, but we aren't guaranteed in general um, that when then this other thread, like the signal handler, is modifying is that the other side is going to get the same value we wrote. By making it an atomic when it's a simple value, it makes sure that all the values are written as one shot, and then the other side reads them as one shot, as opposed to getting fractions or portions of it. It doesn't make as much of a problem here with a bool, but it's still a good practice to use that in general for multi-thread signaling. So that, I'd definitely change that to an atomic bool. So I, we don't know what this um, core common on exit is called yet, but it does say it's an LCD shutdown. Most likely this is going to be called somewhere down at the bottom loop when it, it's done, when it's either told to stop running um, by one of these signals, um, that is going to clean up any resources, any of the communication with the SPI um, LCD and make sure that the VIC anim or fault display program can cleanly start up and use the LCD without it being in some fractional or messed up state because we half send it information and the other side doesn't know that. We see another uncommon procedure here. This is um, anim animate in the frame, so kind of probably going to be some sort of display frame or something related to that. It says LCD display frame 2. Interesting. Um, so the UN16 is another hint that that's probably a pixel frame. And given that it's the, the width and the height, that's kind of a frame buffer information there. And 16, so that's very, very strongly indicating that does something just writes the bytes out to the SPI for the display. It might have to do that procedure there. Might have to do something to tell the display to get going, or maybe it can just do it directly. But that's the core concept is it's going to transfer all the frame data to the LCD for display. So Okay, so we'll get down here. After we set up the signal handlers, the main loop is going to set up the LCD. That typically with an LCD, um, especially one that you have an SPI connection on an embedded device, it's going to need a lot of custom setup bytes sent to it. These are usually pretty confusing. And you're given an example code on a data sheet from a, a display vendor that you just kind of copy and paste from them. And what it's doing is it's telling it how to turn on the LCD, set its um, power regulators, charge pumps, backlight controls if it has a built-in backlight, um, its contrast ratio, how fast it's going to scan. All of those parameters are being set up in that. Um, but they're not real understandable by a normal person, a normal engineer, and how to tweak them. You just kind of are given them and you just kind of send them there. If they don't quite work out for you, you might contact the vendor and kind of ask them to, what else you can change and they might give you some suggestions, but there is, there's only a limited amount of things that you can customize with an LCD there. So they're checking here next the re RC, the return code. So the LCD init, if it ran into some sort of problems, perhaps it couldn't open the, the um, device file to talk to the SPI LCD it ran into an error or it ran into some problem where it's transferring bytes, but the kernel signaled that the write failed. Um, either way, this is a good practice to kind of check the results of trying to transfer data and report an error. They're reporting it on standard out, which is not a good practice in Unix. You'd typically want to report it on standard error. Maybe they had a good reason. Maybe they didn't. Um, usually standard out is buffered. And it's also not the error channel. That's usually your regular output versus you want your error messages to go to standard error. And then they're returning an error code there that there's some sort of problem and exiting the program. So they're definitely not cleaning up there if there's a problem. They're just assuming that it couldn't even start up and so this bail out. Next, what they're doing is opening the animation file. So this is your classic, um, given that path that we talked earlier, it's going to just read only because we can't open it right on a regular file system because the production vector codes file system is read only. And it's a good practice to do that. They get a file descriptor if there's a problem. They just report they couldn't add it. Again, 
they're sending the error message to open, but they're not saying which program created it. You'd kind of, it's good practice and typically to preface this with the name of the program that's reporting the error, because these are often all squished together, mucked together with a bunch of different ones. And so you want to know which one reported the error so you can go back and dig into that. And here they're returning just a negative one that the problem occurred. Okay, so then what they're going to do for is it's going to go to the beginning of the, oh, I'm mistaken. They're going to go to the end of the file by seeking to it. So you could do a different technique one way or the other of using fstat to read the size of the file according to the operating system. You, they're actually just going to go as how, use this other technique of seeking to the end of the file and reading what that position is to get the size of the file. Um, if there's a problem again, they kind of repeat this process of giving an error code. This is very, very programmer specific. A lot of other people wouldn't be able to understand what this error code means. Um, they don't comment in here, but it says total number of frames and the frame bytes per frame. So that you can kind of guess that what it's doing here is calculating the number of frames that are in this animation file um, by taking, of course, the number of bytes in it and number of bytes per frame and dividing and getting that out. Then to read the file, they're going to they memory map the file in, um, which is you know very straightforward. Makes it very clean below here. So they memory map it in just going to read it. They're not going to do any special activities with it. Um, if there's a problem, again, it just report, reports an error. Uh, again, unstandard out. Again, not saying who, who created this or any other information. It's very opaque. What they're doing here, and this is probably not super clear to people who aren't used to the nuances of memory map, they're closing the file resource. So it sounds like, okay, how are they going to use that file again? But memory map retains a copy or a linkage to the file data, even though the file descriptor is closed. So either way, if there was an error, they report it, they report it but they don't exit the program this time. But there is an error. They just drop through because they already have that pointer that they're going to use. Then we go here to the start of the drawing point. Some good comments here. And it's a good description here of 41 milliseconds to draw desired versus a desired frame rate. So what, what's kind of going on is it sounds like it takes 41 milliseconds to send all those bytes out the SBI to the LCD, and that limits the frame rate. Um, if you kind of calculate it out, that is almost 24 frames per second, but not quite. Um, and what they really want for, for this animation file is every frame to be played, and overall, it'd be if you had 24 of them, it would take one second to play the file. Uh, time count, don't know yet what that's going to be. Ah. Here's this loop that we were talking about before. So here's the while, and here's the shutdown flag. Um, and potentially the risk that I mentioned before, if it wasn't an atomic fool, is that the shutdown wouldn't be caught. This, Even though it was set by the interrupt signal handler, um, it would not necessarily have been noticed here in some way, some runs of the compiler. Um, it can. That's kind of a surprising little bug that can happen to programmers where where something happens to signal handler or other thread or an interrupt system. And like it's set the variable set, but how come it's not looking like it's not taking action elsewhere from it? That's kind of what you look for for that kind of bug. So they're, here they're commenting the frame duration. They made it hard coded, uh, which makes sense. It's kind of a convenience here so that they can probably tweak it um, in the debugger if they needed to. Um, but they're going to use that in, in the calculation. Other ways you can do this would be a pound define, but a con this is a good const. Um, if anything, um, it'd almost be recommended to make this, in, again, one of those things in a common header file, because different. If they, if they were to change LCDs, they would probably want to have that LCD specific so that they can tweak it. Some LCDs that are bigger are going to have um, a longer time for the frame to be transferred. They want a bigger number along with the bigger pixel number of pixels in the frame buffer. So it doesn't there isn't a comment here, but we can kind of guess as next frame to draw, time count and frame duration. So time count seems to be some sort of passage of time. Um, and we're kind of look how far we've passed in time and then they're going to figure out which frame to use based upon how long that each frame is and how long it is since since we started and then figure out that frame number. 
up oh, here we go here's the start time so they're getting the the uh, start time which is clock now okay and then they're going to animate so and remember anim is this the data in the file so all of the frames they're going to the frame index and they're going to yep and they're multiplying the frame index by the number of bytes in the frame to cal calculate the offset of the data for that one frame and then they're passing it to animate to draw that frame could use a comment there and now it's in the, getting the end time so hmm i'd say that the start time minus and the end time minus the start time here but probably the duration it took to transfer all that data probably around 41 milliseconds is their typical thing so they're doing that a diff here so they couldn't just subtract it because these are um from the clock using this st chrono um steady clock Thing. They're using, they're having to use a lot of um, extra ceremony to tell the compiler to use the right way of subtracting the two and getting that difference in time, that duration in milliseconds. That's really what's going on here. Is it's just a really complicated way of subtracting. Um, it could use a comment there. So now you're getting diff count here. So time count isn't directly a measure of, of the start when, when the program starts running to now, I was wrong. They actually take how long each frame took and add that up. So it's kind of a kind of a different way of getting how long it's been that they've been displaying stuff. Um, time count, and then they're checking here. It says roll time count over if it exceeds the total duration of the animation. So they're checking the time count, um, how how long it's gone. If it's gone um, longer than the animation file is in terms of milliseconds, you know, so they're multiplying the number of frames times the duration of each frame, 41 milliseconds per frame, and getting that time. If it's longer than that, they are chopping that off and going back to the beginning, but they're retaining the part off. So if the, if the animation is 1,000 milliseconds long and they're 1,200 milliseconds into it, they're going to retain the 200 milliseconds portion. That math doesn't quite work out, but that's because I didn't quite multiply 41 milliseconds correctly. But they're retaining that fractional part so that it kind of has a smooth rollover when the animation loops back. And then this this kind of goes back up to the top and plays the next frame. So there's no delay between frames. It just keeps grabbing each frame and then sending it out and then playing the next frame. And if what really happens is because it takes time to send that next frame out, that is slowing us down. So that we're not sending them all out instantly. That just the mere practice of sending them out slows us down to pace this out. And the animation program could be paused or delayed while other all these other applications are starting if they have a higher priority and the operating system gives more time to run. So, so some of this math here probably smooths that out if this this program kind of would otherwise stutter or fall behind. If there, if we do get a shutdown code, it exits, and here they're going to clean up. So they're unmapping the animation. So they're just cleaning up the resource. They wouldn't really have to do this um, in Unix because when the Unix application exits, the kernel cleans up this stuff. But it's a really good practice to do this. Every programmer should just do a good cleanup. If there's an error, notice that they're um, they're not exiting here. So they are. Printing another error message again, the same comment that it's not going out the error channel, but instead it's being printed to standard out, and it's not really telling us who had the error, which program had it during the startup. Um, and then next, they're calling this LCD shutdown. To speculation here is that they're going to clean up the LCD to make certain that it isn't a half a frame or any other gobbledygook. They, they might be turning the LCD off, or they didn't like to just putting it in state. But either way, it's so that the regular Vic Anim application software can run and do the face animation, or if there's a printed problem, the fault code display program can take over the LCD and run it. Um, I don't see anywhere anyone that called this. Um, let's go look. Nope, one match. So this appears to be dead code. This appears to be a procedure which is not called by anyone. I don't see anywhere else in the code that any other program that would call portions of this. Um, it just seems to be left over. It could be that in this this other file that gets linked against this core.lcd.h, 
that perhaps when it runs into an error, it calls the calls a common thing that in each of the applications is supposed to provide and customize for a shutdown that that it calls it. In our case, this boot anim, it has no real customization other than just clean up the LCD. So for instance, perhaps Vic Anum is called the shutdown because the LCD had a catastrophic problem. I mean I'm just speculating here. Um, Vic Anna might want to clean up the sound system and clean up a bunch of IPC inner process communication, post default code, and then exit. So that could, that's just all speculation that that might be called by this lower level um, bridge code that would contact the LCD driver. Um, excuse me, not LCD. That's incorrect. So this other code that would interact with the LCD, so it would be a user level driver um, using the rest of the SPI system. And that is the rest of that file.